My name is David Milstein, and it is really my real pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, Professor Omar Yagi from uh, UC Berkeley. He has also recently established at Berkeley uh, the Global uh, Science Institute, uh, which is a very interesting institute, very interesting concept. Omar is a uh, world-renowned pioneer in the design of uh, new materials. He really uh, uh, is an example of how one can take a basic concept in science, fundamental concept, and then bring it to uh, useful materials, some of them being uh, used actually industrially. Um, he has designed many, uh, many materials. Uh, perhaps the most notable ones are the, uh, what is now called the MOF and COF. The MOF, as, uh, so it's the metal organic frameworks. Uh, um, these are frameworks based on coordination chemistry of, of metals. And the COF is the um, uh, covalent organic frameworks based on covalent bonds. These materials have enormous uh, surface um, uh, area. They can absorb uh, large amounts of other molecules, uh, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and others, and are, some are used in industry. So uh, it's, um, as a result of his efforts, um, Omar received many awards, most notably, uh, most recently, uh, the Wolf Prize, just a few weeks ago, that he shared uh, with our next speaker, Makoto Fujita. So Omar, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here uh, among this distinguished panel of uh, speakers and in this extremely fascinating um, conference. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about reticular chemistry. Reticular chemistry, the word reticular is from reticulum in Latin, and it it's, has something to do with net, net-like or small net. And as you will see, that's not too dissimilar from some of the structures that I will be uh, talking about. I like this word because uh, really what we've done is to link molecules together to make frameworks that look like nets, uh, as you um, will see throughout my... Uh, lecture today. So the result of linking molecular building units into, into frameworks has been to extend metal organic chemistry, which is coordination complexes and organometallic complexes, into the domain of two-dimensional extended structures and three-dimensional extended metal organic structures. So. Um, if, if, if I want to be forward, I could say we've extended metal organic chemistry from being discrete into extended 2D and 3D structures. And I can say the same thing about organic chemistry, is that we've taken organic chemistry from being about molecules and polymers into 2D and 3D dimensional uh, extend or 3D extended uh, 2D and 3D extended structures. So reticular chemistry is the chemistry beyond the molecule. Both building those structures into 2D and 3D and studying their chemistry. Now why do I want to do that? Why do I want to take something like a molecule, a beautiful molecule that organic chemists and inorganic chemists have been working on for a long time and make them all extended? And uh, you know, at least on a fundamental level, if you think of a molecule as a collection of atoms and that the molecule fixes the atom in specific geometry and spatial arrangements, you can think of the framework as uh, fixing the molecules in specific geometry a specific connectivity and specific spatial arrangements. But when you go to the molecule, when you go to the framework, you encompass space within which you can do two things. One, you can address that molecule that is now fixed in space. And second, you can manipulate matter within the space that is encompassed by the framework. So that's why reticular chemistry has uh, taken off, because it has provided chemists with one extra control over matter. So let me just take you back from the very beginning of extended structures that 
look like they're metal organic, okay? Prussian blue is well known to all of us, and that's one example, a uh, well-established example. Depending on your point of view, you could think of it as inorganic or organic. I like to think of it as inorganic because you can't functionalize the cyanide. So I would not call this one a moth. Um, the uh, Prussian blues are exactly the same. They're, they're layered cyanides, they're 2D cyanides. And again, they cannot functionalize that. So that is what is known in metal organics in terms of extended structures. But if you look deeply into the literature, now to these days, deeply means 1959 or thereabouts, um, you, see this, you see truly inspiring structures like this. For someone like me who's interested in linking metal complexes with organics and organics that can be functionalized, this is certainly a beautiful structure because this is an adiponitrile linked by copper one to make an extended three-dimensional structure. The reason this is exciting is because if indeed this framework is robust enough, I can do chemistry on this organic and thereby functionalize that space that I was talking about that is encompassed by the framework. So that's that I would say this is the first example. I'm not saying that it's robust. I'm just saying this is an example in the literature where it was possible to link a metal ion with a dinitrile. And I want you to remember that this is a neutral linker. So that's making this copper one nitrile bond a weak bond, about 60 or 70 kilojoules per mole. Keep that in mind because it will become relevant later as to why MOFs emerged. Second example is exactly the same as that example, except it was published in 1986, and it's a diimino dinitrile. So from a chemical point of view, it's exactly the same. Copper one bound to nitrile to make another diamond structure. So that's another example that has been reported. In 1989, there was a paper in JAX that came out, and it did exactly the same thing, except now this is a tetranitrile. It's a tetrahedron linked by copper one. Okay, and the same group has extended this concept to include other building units, but exactly the same kind of, of uh, chemistry, where now, instead of nitrile, you have bipyridine, another neutral linker, weak bond to copper one. Now, this paper neglected to reference all the old literature, okay? Tens of structures that are known in that way. And so you will find in today's world that everybody's citing this paper as being an important paper, not looking back and thinking about what was done before. Nevertheless, this is, all these examples have stood as, I would say, sculptures rather than anything useful because it turns out that these weak bonds make these frameworks very fragile or very frail, and they collapse if you try to use their porosity. Now, the examples continue. Zawaratko in 95 made this bipyridine. Fujita made this bipyridine. And when I started as assistant professor, we also started with bipyridine. Very easy to make these. But they stood, again, they stood as examples of lovely structures, but that's where it all stopped. They were just lovely and not useful. Because when you try to exchange the anion, they collapsed. And therefore, their porosity was still a challenge. So these, what I call coordination networks, which are made from neutral linkers and metal ions, collapse upon removal of solvent or exchange of ions. There was, they were not designable because they're made from single metal ion vertices. Notice all of them have vertices that are made from copper one or some metal ion like that. And, and as you all know, metal ions can have many different geometries, many different connectivities, and so it was not able to, you're not able to design them. And they're not chemically stable because they're made from metal nitrogen bonds. So I reported the first MOFs that are similar to the old MOFs, and I gave a, a Gordon conference very early on in 95. 
probably Makoto, maybe we met in that Gordon conference. And everybody was very upset, especially the professors in the front, some of them German. Okay, they stood up, not you, not Helmut, uh, stood up and they were very upset because we have not, we've been calling these open frameworks, we've been implying that they're porous, but we have not proved that they were porous. And we couldn't prove that they were porous because they kept collapsing. So I need to get tenure. Okay, so I needed to do a serious experiment. A serious experiment was, as an inorganic chemist, I realized that you need to move away from neutral linkers and start with charged linkers. A charged linker, when linked with a metal ion, you have, in addition to the covalency of the bond, you have the ionic interaction, and that made it much, much stronger. In fact, twice or three times as strong as a neutral linker. And so, and this, this was the first thing, is that create a stronger bonds. The second thing, create larger entities, multi-metallic entities that can be rigid, that fix the geometry of the metal, in this case zinc, and then obviate the need to control the geometry of the metal because now you can link this cluster from these carbons. And so this will always be a square. So we found that these metal acetates are ideal building units, targets, because they're rigid, they're directional, and they have one kind of coordination geometry, which means that if I have the right reaction conditions that produce this, I can begin to design, and they were made from strong bonds. That was really the key insight into changing that equation around, where instead of having those nice structures, now they will be nice, but also, as you will see shortly, porous. Now, a development that, we, that I don't talk too much about is that we found the conditions under which to crystallize things from strong bonds. So clusters like this now can be linked by this terephthalate to make two-dimensional, in this case, two-dimensional structures, and DMF fills the pores as a solvent that is trapped during the synthesis. Now, if you, um, it, it turns out that this cocktail of solvent and base, the base deprotonates the acid. If you dilute this base with solvent, you can control the nucleation, and in the end, instead of getting an amorphous material, you get a crystalline material. I can talk a lot about the, the different thinking involved in making these as, as crystals. But, um, but I won't, just to say that these are crystalline and we can get their crystal structure uh, from single crystal X-ray diffraction. In fact, all the structures I will show today are a result of X-ray single crystal diffraction. So that was crystallized. That, um, and now the question was that the zeolite chemists were hounding me, is are they truly porous? And to... To determine whether something is truly porous, you have to do what is called gas sorption isotherm. There's no other way of doing that. And that's done at 77 Kelvin, it has to be done at 77 Kelvin, and at low pressure. And you introduce, evacuate the pores, and to test whether your material remains architecturally robust and open, you do what's called a, um, you, you take up gases like nitrogen, so adsorption and desorption, that's for nitrogen, and adsorption and desorption for CO2. And the type 1 isotherm, the shape of this isotherm is a type 1 isotherm, is uh, what indicates that the material is open and that gases can pass in and out without deforming the material. And without the material having to prop the openings wide open for things to go in. So this was a proof for the first time that you have permanent porosity. And it was very exciting to me because although the surface area was kind of low, it allowed us to determine the porosity as in the surface area and pore volume and compare the porosity of MOFs with the more established porous materials like zeolite and mesoporous silica and porous carbon for the first time. And so I was excited to see this that in fact these architecture robust and that our secondary building block approach, our cluster building block approach, 
can produce architecturally stable results. And so um, this was the first proof of porosity for MOFs, and we published it in 1998. Nobody paid any attention to this paper except me and the students that were on the paper. And actually, I got three incredibly positive reviews that said this is a breakthrough in the field. But no one, when we published it in JAX, nobody paid any attention. So, but they did pay attention, the community did pay attention. When we did this, um, instead of 2D structures, we targeted three-dimensional structures, and we made what we called MOF5, Metal Organic Framework Number 5. And there, the surface area that we uh, obtained um, at the time was 2,900 meters square per gram. That broke all porosity records held by carbon for a thousand years, held by mesoporous silica, by zeolites. All those were destroyed uh, by at least threefold when we reported this surface area. So the discovery of this extremely high surface area caused a lot of people to take note that now porous material can be made from metal oxide units and, more importantly, organics. And now the organics can be functionalized, and the metal oxide units, of course, the metals can be varied, the clustering can be varied. Later on, a few years later, we optimized the porosity, and it turns out it's much, much higher than we thought it was. Uh, what I mean by optimizing porosity is that we learned how to remove the gas from the pores uh, with uh, completely and get the um, in the uh, porosity of the, the true porosity of the material. We put the yellow ball in here. We debated whether the ball should be green or purple or pink. And in the end, I was at Arizona State at the time, and it's very sunny there, and the sun shines, and so the yellow one out. And that became really a signature of, of, these, uh, of these moths. So thus the birth of reticular chemistry. It's the chemistry of linking molecular building blocks by strong bonds to make crystalline extended structures. It's the chemistry that is, takes chemistry beyond the molecule. And we made moths. And you don't need metals. You could make coughs, which are made entirely of organics, linking organic building units together. These are the two that I will talk about today. I won't talk about ZIFs, but they're a subclass of MOFs that are based on zeolite nets. That SBU approach that we used in the, in the initial MOF could be used to link triangles and squares, as was done here. It could be used to link trigonal prisms together to make fantastic structures. Could be used to link triangles, linking squares. And so this was our chance to play Lego chemistry. When I was a child, I didn't have Legos. So now this is, I am playing Lego at an older age. Now notice that you can use a sophistication of organic chemistry. If you put a bromo here, uh, Sub, uh, functionality, that turns the carboxylates at 90 degrees to each other, and therefore turns these clusters, which are squares, at 90 degrees to each other. And so you get what we call the NBO net. You can link trigonal prisms to make new nets, link cube octahedra to make these fantastic structures that are not just architecturally and thermally robust, but also now chemically robust. They can be refluxed in water, they can be heated in acid and base, they are extremely stable structures. Linking cubes and squares, linking cube octahedra and squares, whatever you like could be linked in the same way and to make materials that are truly porous. Uh, we also, now we, we can talk about combining different shapes. Okay, whether they're organic and, or inorganic, we have this reticular table that makes it a reality for somebody to think up a net and then combine the building units to make that net and with different shapes. Not just triangles, squares, and tetrahedra, but also hexagons, all various geometries. All of these have been made using moths of different composition, uh, metals, and different organics. 
So here's a, here's a moth, a typical moth, where everything you're looking at, whether it's the organic linker or the metal oxide units, is an adsorptive site. This, this, uh, this structure is supposed to be rotating. Maybe, let me see if, uh, oh, okay. All right, that works. Um, moths, unlike other porous materials, the pores have no walls. So things can diffuse in and out with great facility. The pores never get clogged. And as I said, the fact that everything you're looking at is a surface, is an adsorptive site, gives you extremely high surface area. So the reason I say everything you're looking at is an adsorptive site, because we did a crystal structures at 30 Kelvin. We introduced gases and then saw electron density being localized on the metal oxide units and on the edges of the six-membered rings, as well as the faces of the six-membered rings. So everything, and that's why they have extremely high surface area. So one of the things that, um, that we wanted to do early on with this high porosity is that if you have adsorptive sites on the internal surface, now you can use them to attract molecules like hydrogen or methane so that now the, these gas molecules would be attracted to the surface and overcome the gas-gas uh, repulsion. So that means I can compact gases on the surface without having to pressurize the material. Okay, and that's, that dust was the first point of applications that we worked with BASF to scale up MOFs to multi-ton quantities. And the first application we looked at was hydrogen storage and showed that at 77 Kelvin, you can store 12 weight percent of hydrogen. Okay, this is 77 Kelvin. It's not as cold as 20 Kelvin, but 77 Kelvin is, um, uh, um, it, it, um, is not quite as interesting for automobile fueling, but it is interesting for stationary applications of, uh, of hydrogen storage. 12 weight percent means that a tank filled with moth can store double the amount of hydrogen than a tank that does not have the moth. Even though the moth occupies volume, but the moth is compacting the gas within its pores by virtue of the attraction of the hydrogen to the interior or to those adsorptive sites. At room temperature, this material takes up about 2 weight percent and that's uh, interesting enough for Mercedes to build uh, a demonstration automobile or a demonstration uh, sedan that has MOF pressurized uh, in a MOF, uh, a hydrogen car uh, with a fuel tank that has a MOF pressurized with hydrogen. Now, for methane storage, the same idea is that you design a MOF that attracts the methane to those adsorptive sites, and if you have high surface area, um, you can make uh, materials that now, in this uh, car, there's a fuel tank that's filled with moth, and at reasonable pressures of 80 to 100 bar, you're storing three times the amount of methane that you would without the moth in that tank. Room temperature, 100 bar. So that means this automobile can travel three times the distance before it has to refuel, the MOF can be used over and over and over again, over 100,000 cycles, and therefore you can regenerate, or you don't have to uh, every time change the MOF, the MOF can stay in the, uh, in the car for the lifetime of the automobile. Carbon capture is another application. By the way, this, is, this was ready to launch uh, about three years ago, and as you, if you remember, three years ago, oil prices plummeted down to $40 a barrel. Now they're coming back up, and this is becoming more and more interesting to be launched. But this is ready to go. Everything from cycling, the, uh, the methane, to everything that, is, that needs to be done with this automobile has already been done. This is ready, ready to launch. The application that I'm also very, very interested in and very excited about is water harvesting from desert air. 
there's a lot of water in, in desert, well, there's a lot of water in the atmosphere. There's as much water in the atmosphere as we have fresh water in lakes and rivers on our planet. So this is water that potentially can be trapped in the desert and used. And the big discovery here was that we found a moth, and I won't describe the moth uh, because uh, I want to focus more on the, on the building of structures and the basic science of that, but, but I want to show this, is that we show that in this red curve here, you see that water goes into the moth at around 20% relative humidity. And it looks like the first few water molecules go in and then water rushes in to make what looks like a cooperative effect. Okay, that we found that the initial water molecules adhere to the internal surface and they make very nice little aggregates of cubes and tetrahedra. And those are nucleation sites for further water to go in and hydrogen bond to the initial water molecules. So that was very, very exciting, the fact that you have this sharp uptake. The other thing that was exciting is that you can take out the water at 45 degrees. Now for most materials like clays and zeolites and other materials that could trap water from the atmosphere, uh, you have to heat up the material to 300, perhaps 400 degrees C to remove the water, and that wouldn't be economical. So you need a material that only can uh, remove the water at, at reasonable temperature. 45 degrees is the temperature potentially in the desert during the day. So my idea was, well, that means we can have this moth take up the water at night in the desert, and we can then remove the water during the day. The only thing you need is a way to condense the water without having to put in any energy other than ambient sunlight. And that's what we have successfully done. Um, this is the latest device. Uh, this paper will come out just, I think, in the next couple of days. It's a box within a box. The outside box is the condenser. The inside box has the moth. Um, the, the lid on the outside box is open during the night. Desert air comes in, saturates the moth. During the day, you close that, and now the interior of the box is heated because of the sunlight. But outside, you have lower temperature than the inside, and so the vapor that's coming out condenses on the walls, and you can collect water. It turns out that we have done this experiment both in the lab and this prototype was also uh, tested in Arizona, in the deserts of Arizona, in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it turns out that we can deliver, excuse me, this should be point, is there a point there? That should be 0.25 liter of water per liter of moth per cycle. That's exactly what we have been able to harvest in this device in Arizona, in the real, under real conditions, without any electric except ambient sunlight shining onto this box. 0.2 liter of water per liter of moth per cycle, per uptake and release cycle. And the water, we tested the water for presence of any metal or any organic contamination, and it's completely pure water. In fact, this student, Eugene, is going to drink the water, and he will not, um, he will still be alive at the end. Nice. <laughs> okay, there it is. Okay, so it's a clean water free of metal ions and organics. This is really a revolution in terms of trapping water from low humidity atmosphere in the in arid regions of the world. Okay, so that's that's an important direction for for moths. Another direction in terms of uh, I would say interesting directions or challenges in moths is that you can I showed you how you can make robust backbone. Now the reason we wanted them to be architecturally and chemically robust thermally robust because we are going to be running chemical reactions on them. And in this case, you run seven post-synthetic modification to install various amino acids onto the interior that we aim them to be similar to the active site of this TEV protease to see whether, in fact, the moth 
cleaves this bond as this enzyme would. So this enzyme is selective towards cleaving this bond and only this bond, this uh, amide bond. And by functionalizing the interior, we can do exactly the same. It's as selective as the enzyme, but the kinetics are not as good as the enzyme, potentially because we chose a moth that is just a tunnel moth, and things may, may not, the kinetics may not be as good as if we chose a three-dimensionally open structure. But this shows that you can install entities that resemble the active site of enzyme without affecting the backbone of the moth and still be able to uh, have the same kind of selectivity. So this, I think, is a very promising direction. Another promising direction is editing these frameworks. Here is a moth composed of these kinds of linkers and these clusters. You can replace the zinc ions in this and some of the linkers, as you see here. This, so you take out these linkers and then add in new ones. In this case, a linker that has different functionality and different metals. So in a way, and get, this is a crystal that goes to another crystal that goes to another crystal. And all of these are single crystal structures. So in a way, you're taking an extended structure and you're going in and surgically remove and replace and put instead a different functionality. I think that this is a very uh, interesting direction that's not possible in any other kind of materials. Another direction that I like is that if, um, if it's possible to make this analogy to DNA. The backbone of DNA is like the backbone of moth. It's just a repetitive uh, periodic array of a sugar uh, polyphosphate chains and onto which you have nucleotides that are covalently linked. And the way they arrange themselves gives you sequences. So this is the backbone, which is like the backbone of the moth periodic repeating. And these are the nucleotides that, are, that make sequences. That's not really a far-fetched analogy in terms of the concept is that here's the backbone of the moth, and we can introduce covalently onto that backbone different functionalities. We have demonstrated 10 different functionalities that can be installed to make what we think sh we should be thinking about is functional group sequences. We find that these systems that have what I think is uh, an analogy to, to nucleotides in DNA is that these sequences potentially could code for specific properties, okay? Now, we know exactly where they are. We know that they are all on the orthophenylene unit. We also know their ratios relative to each other, and we also know how far they are from each other. So we know a lot because of the fact that the backbone is periodic. We know exactly how far they are from each other. What we don't know is this, their spatial arrangement, what is sitting next to what. And that's the challenge that we need to figure out. But in the meantime, these structures are trapping carbon dioxide at 400% better than structures that are not mixed in this way. So I think that this is a direction that is made possible by the fact that you have a periodic backbone that can be functionalized. Any other structure that is functionalized in this way would not maintain its, its, its structure. So, so I would say that that's another direction. Now, in the last, um, I don't know how much time I have, but 10 minutes, 10 minutes, okay. Um, now I want to show you how we have taken organic chemistry to 2D and 3D. You see here, back in 93, when I studied as assistant professor, Rolf Hoffman wrote an article in Scientific American where he said organic chemists are masterful at exercising control in zero dimension. One subculture of organic chemists has learned to exercise control in one dimension. These are the polymer chemists, the chain builders, but in two and three dimension, it is a synthetic wasteland. There was nothing there before um, 
concerning 2D and 3D extended organic structures. So to make a long story short, and many, many graduate students later, we have been able to find the conditions under which we can balance the thermodynamics and the kinetics of crystallization using this, these conditions to make structures of this kind that are based on the trimerization of boronic acid to make a linker that is based on the triboroxine and hydride. So now these, the, by using the diboronic acid, you can make the triboroxine as triangular linkers linked by to this uh, phenylene unit, ditopic phenylene unit, to make extended structures of this kind. This is not a crystalline, this is not a single crystal, but it's a, it's a, a, a crystalline powder. You can see the X-ray powder diffraction, and we take the IR and boron NMR to make sure the reaction is complete and that all the functionalities have been condensed in the triboroxine ring. Now, prior to this, I had many, many students for many, many years who would run reactions like this, and all they get is a big hump in the X-ray powder diffraction. And now, instead of a hump, you see these beautiful, uh, sharp X-ray powder diffraction lines. The structure that we get from that is a slipped graphitic uh, type structure. This is the first cough. You can extend that from 2D to 3D by using tetrahedral building units and, again, the triboroxine condensation reaction using very similar conditions to what I just showed you to link triangles with tetrahedra and make two different structures that are possible from linking triangles and tetrahedra, the carbon nitride structure and the borosite structure. This is the X-ray powder diffraction for the CTN structure. This is the ultimately how we made the borosite structure by linking instead of triboroxine but by this triangular unit to make linkages that are based on boronic esters. In this structure, of course, just like the other one, this is entirely composed from light elements, boron, carbon, and oxygen, and it's the lightest solid or material ever made aside from lithium at room temperature, and it has a very high surface area. Okay, so up to now, I've shown you examples of extended Metal complex chemistry, 2D and 3D. Organic chemistry extended to 2D and 3D. I showed you some applications, and you can imagine this area basically exploded because of the level of control that we can have on extended structures, the same kind of precision that one exercises in molecular chemistry and metal complex chemistry now can be exercised in extended structures. Well, not only can you do the triboroxine as a linker, because there was a lot of discussion about you can't crystallize these things because they're made from irreversible interactions or whatever. There were many, many excuses as to why you can't crystallize it, why you can't do something. So the imine linkages can be crystallized. I won't go through the details of that. The hydrazone linkages can be crystallized. The borazine linkages can be crystallized. Even the triazine, what people said couldn't be crystallized, can be crystallized. Polyimids, phenazines, okay? And so really, just like uh, molecular organic chemists do retrosynthesis on their molecules, now we are doing retrosynthesis on frameworks where we imagine the nets, decompose them into their building units, look at the angles between the building units and within the building units, pick the molecules that you need, and then assemble them into the framework. Unlike MOFs, here we know the structures that are going to result, or at least we have good candidates. We simulate their X-ray powder diffraction and then match it to what we get out. And that gives you a good starting point for solving their crystal structures. What about linkages you can't crystallize? Okay, eventually you're going to hit some linkages that are either too strong or too irreversible that you can't crystallize. Here we can take things that we can crystallize, like imine linkages, and then carry out chemistry on them to convert them, in this case, from imine to amide. Okay, this is the amide linkage. Amide-linked coughs cannot be made using the methods I just showed you, but they can be made post-synthetically. So let's think about what we just did. We just took an extended structure with Avogadro's number of imine bonds and converted every bond to an amide bond. 
without affecting, this is another one, without affecting the crystallinity of the solid. Okay, it's still as crystalline. So I'm using this extended crystal as a molecule. Okay, and that gives us access into linkages that otherwise cannot be made. So you can see where I'm going with this. Now you can take the imine linkages and now edit them with these linkages and then make linkages that you can't make any other way. Okay, the future challenge is could we use this method to make materials that are entirely composed of carbon-carbon bonds? That's the dream. But you can see that this dream is all of a sudden looks reasonable because of the, not just the ability to crystallize, but the ability to insert units in a solid and do covalent chemistry on them and produce covalent linkages. Again, these are the structures where you've gone from the imine to these covalent uh, linkages without affecting the crystallinity of the material, without affecting the porosity of the material. And then just to, to close on the coughs, now you can recently, uh, or very soon, you will see a paper in Science where instead of X-ray powder uh, diffraction, you will see single crystal X-ray diffraction. So we have also been successful in making single crystal structures of coughs, bringing them into the precision of crystallography that is done on molecules. So these are, you can see 100 micron 50 micron or 60 micron crystals of covalent organic framework, something that I would have never dreamt of. So, coughs are now um, a very uh, active area of research, again, because of the precision with which the structures could be assembled, reactions that can be run on those structures, and all the chemistry that could be done and applications that could be done by virtue of encompassing that space. Okay, the final segment, just two minutes, and I will finish, is weaving. So I've talked about rigidity. I talked about openness of their structures and their chemistry. But what about introducing dynamics? How would you introduce dynamics in a solid? One way, you could use flexible linkers. I don't like it, because you have to basically flex the whole structure, and we all know that you're going to break some bonds in the process. It's too, too, too traumatic for a framework to do breathing, okay? Instead, I would say weaving is a better way of doing dynamics. That's why our clothes are still woven. Nobody has ever figured out a way of making clothes without weaving, okay? And the reason they're very flexible and resilient is because they're made from mechanically linked threads, okay? Threads that are interlaced and therefore, when, I, when you bend them, these threads only move around with respect to each other without getting unraveled. They can't unravel. And so now you have dynamics. You have reversible movements without having to stress bonds and create defects and break down your structure. So this is, this is another challenge. This is the future direction of MOFs and COFs. So I'm going to show you how we can weave COFs. So here is a, here's what I mean by weaving threads that are interlaced in and out of each other. And you might see in the literature people talk about weaving, but you have to be able to strip the fat to see what is there. And to strip the fat, you have to think about the interactions within the thread must be much stronger than the interaction between the threads. Otherwise, it's useless to think of weaving. Okay, so the threads have to be made from strong bonds throughout, but then they would be interlaced by either mechanical bonds or some kind of weak interactions. Okay, so this is how we have been able to do this. You take this diphenanthroline complex, okay, where you have, I should say here, that no one can make these structures unless they think from a reticular chemist's point of view, which is just to think about the building unit. The building unit is this, this up and down. If I have this as a molecule, as a building unit, I can link it up using cough chemistry into this and this and this, and then ultimately make the ordered structure. And that's exactly what we did. 
Okay, so you take this up and down, this diphenylthridine complex, functionalize it with aldehyde, copolymerize it with imine, and you make a thread that weaves in with another thread by virtue of the copper bringing the phenanthroline units together. This is an ordered structure. I'll show you the X-ray positive fraction shortly. And you can remove the copper, and the structure does not get unraveled. This demetallated form can be metallated, and you can go back and forth between the two. This has no mechanism to decompose. It is still, uh, still woven, although amorphous, and we want it to be amorphous so that it's flexible. Okay, but it's completely reversible. You go from an amorphous phase into a crystalline phase. This, needless to say, that we measured the elasticity of this material is tenfold more elastic than this material. So this is, we, we use single crystal, X, uh, uh, excuse me, powder X-ray diffraction in this case and electron uh, diffraction to decipher the structure. And you're looking at the first woven, molecularly woven structure in chemistry and it takes coughs and moths one step beyond to introduce into this every, all the attributes I've been talking about, introducing dynamics in addition to porosity and uh, functionalizability. Well, everything you can think of could be woven. All you have to do is make sure you have that up and down and that you can control the angles between them. So applying reticular chemistry to them. So you could make things as, as intricate as this woven pattern where you have one up and one down, or two up and one down, or two up and two down, and so on. Okay, you can make not just the structure I showed you, but other structures can be woven. This is a typical chain link fence over here. This is what you will see in the fences out there. You can link three-dimensional, you can make three-dimensional structures, meaning this is just a fragment of a sodalite structure by weaving threads together to make um, woven three-dimensional uh, mineral type of structures. So, in summary, what we have done is that we have gone beyond these Prussian blues and clathrates beyond Werner complexes that have led to tremendous achievements in metal clusters, in organometallic chemistry, in bioinorganic chemistry, in polyoxoanion chemistry, in metal carbonyl chemistry. And we've taken coordination polymers that are made from weak bonds, supramolecular assemblies that are made from metal organics, and we realize them in chemical structures by precision reticular chemistry and then turn these chemical structures into true materials that have applications. The same thing with the covalent bond. The, uh, the, the, the thinking of Lewis and how atoms interact together to make molecules that has become a covalent bond, what we think of today as the covalent bond, has led to major discoveries or major directions in organic chemistry that have changed the way we think, whether it's the host gas chemistry or the total synthesis of complex molecules or dendromers, or most recently the catenanes and uh, uh, mechanical bond, propelled that all the way into 2D and 3D extended structures and lately woven structures, combining both the covalent bond and the mechanical bond. So, if you think about what we have just done, we've created basically a platform onto which you can do a lot of things. The thing that I'm really most excited about is that onto these platforms, you can put functionalities, you can put many functionalities, you can arrange them in whatever metric arrangement you want, electronic arrangement you want, and perhaps, perhaps, the challenge for the future, perhaps we can have sequences and be able to decipher those sequences that code for very specific properties. So reticular chemistry is the realm of control of the strong bond beyond the molecule, and I want to acknowledge the funding, as well as, in addition to the students I've acknowledged on the slides, 
acknowledge my group. Thank you very much for the invitation, for your attention. Thank you very much, Omar, for this exciting uh, lecture, uh, inspirational, I should say. Uh, the lecture is open for discussion. Please. So, uh, this beautiful uh, uh, natural or, or uh, framework structures, when you put them in open air, as you described in your desert experiment, water absorption, after some cycles, they inevitably will uh, absorb also contaminants because the, the atmosphere is full of, of all kinds of molecules that are not uh, desirable other than water. So what will happen eventually? Will they poison the sites, absorption sites or not? And is there a way to get rid of this intoxicant or pollution in, in your framework? So um, thank you. I, I didn't say too much about the water absorption because I wanted to get to the building of the structures. Um, Remember, the moth, so there are several things to consider. Water loves to get into the moth. Okay, so that's one. It binds to the framework much, strong, much more strongly than any other gas in the atmosphere. Any organic, if you happen to be next to a, I don't know, a chemical plant and there is benzene around, um, that's prevented from getting into the moth because the pore size is not large enough to allow organic molecules to go in, okay? Dust and particles like that, that's an already well worked out science that you can filter them out. So the moth is really acting not just as a place to attract the first water molecules and concentrate them, but also as a filter. And then you're condensing it out and getting pure, pure water. Oh, yes, yes. So there are, I, I neglected to, to mention this, but there's, a, you know, there's a, over a thousand researchers around the world working on this stuff. And there's, I would say, over a hundred researchers working on separation of gases. And separation of gases is one of the favorite things you know, to do because they are the closest to applications. So there's already a couple of applications on the market that involve gas storage and gas separation. So they are ideal for gas separation because the adsorptive size that I just showed you can be modified and tailored to, to have the right binding energy for gases. Needless to say that also the metals can be exposed and they act also as adsorptive sites or as sites where you can discriminate between molecules yeah. So hydrocarbon separations are, are very interesting. Gas separations are very interesting right now. Yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. Uh, N2 methane separations, CO um, hydrogen separation. All of those are being investigated with great success. Yeah. And membranes, membranes with moths are being made to uh, on you know for gas separation. Yeah. Um, moths and coughs, molecules, just as our catenines and rituxanes and whatever else are molecules. And so is it appropriate to talk about uh, them being constructed of molecules? Once you've made them, the entities that were the building blocks are no longer molecules. Um, and, you know, I think I've gone on record as saying that a metal organic framework, if it's crystalline, the crystal is the molecule and the molecule is the crystal. Yes, um, that's basically what we've shown in this chemistry. I mean, um, Fraser, I think you were the first to say this in the literature, to use the crystal as a molecule and the molecule as a crystal. And the fact that you can do chemistry on the crystal without the crystal becoming amorphous and, and also maintaining porosity. Yes, the crystal, a macroscopic crystal, is a molecule. And the molecule that is being held in the framework is, is the crystal. I agree with you fully, yeah. 
The only difference between a molecule and a crystal in terms of the practice is that the molecules tend to be soluble. These crystals are not soluble. So it allows you to do a lot more with them. Yeah. I don't know. Where is uh, Danny? Dan <laughs> Danny. Um, people so far have been trying. I don't... I, no, no. I, I think that... I think that that people are trying. I mean, people have made uh, quasi crystals in mesoporous silica, so I I think that it's possible. Yeah. I mean, I am the first to say everything is possible, but I don't want to say it because you think I'm maybe too optimistic and too naive. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can get this last. Question. Well, I mean, moths. I showed you moths are stable in. You know, they're thermally stable up to 300, 400 degrees C. They're chemically stable. I showed you examples where you're running reactions overnight in water, in, uh, in boiling solvents. The, the, they are stable. That was 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, they're not stable. They're going to blow up. They're made mostly of organic. They're going to burn up. That's all has been settled. Um, I think in terms of how much uh, hydrogen is being stored, We've gone from binding energies of about three and a half kilojoules per mole all the way to 13 kilojoules per mole by modifying the, the pores, and about 2% by weight at room temperature. To get to 6% or 7% or more, you need to go up to 20 kilojoules per mole for the binding energy. So we need to find new tricks on how to bind hydrogen strongly without making a covalent bond that requires you to heat up the material like you would with the, with the alloys. So there are things that you might think about. You could, you could have these frustrated Lewis acid, Lewis base sites that decorate the pores and that you have a soft chemisorption for hydrogen as, as has been demonstrated in the literature in molecules. So you could have that. So I think that that's one direction that, that we're thinking about, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.